Okay, great. So with respect to the magic and wonder or anything like that, the, this is aptly named roughly Harry Potter-like with, with Voldemort. I, uh, I think the only thing I can possibly pull off in a British accent is Harry Potter, but that's only because I loved, <laughs> I don't know if it was really good, but I, like, enjoy, I enjoy doing it. The movies are great. <coughs> so, so this talk is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind tour for, for all of you, for me, to talk about both exploration around my interest in linguistics, as well as some really, really interesting phenomenon that come from my uh, exploration around human natural languages, as well as all of the programming that I've done and will eventually talk about a little bit. <coughs> so I am uh, a huge fan of something called Duolingo. Have any of you heard of Duolingo? Have you used this? Okay, so I have, this is actually an old screenshot. Uh, it says 654, I'm at over 680 right now. I take, I, I do this completely recreationally. I take roughly Spanish, a single lesson in Spanish, French, and German every day. I can only speak Spanish and only broken and only so that New York people can sort of understand me. Um, but French and, French and German, I have a very, very base level vocabulary on. I am extremely, extremely addicted. Where is this? I'm extremely addicted to the, um, hmm. there we go. I'm extremely addicted to the streak aspect of Duolingo. Every time, after you get past maybe three or four months of getting this streak and building that up, I'm now at a stage where if I lost this, I would cry. <laughs> like a baby, I would cry. Every morning, before I do basically anything else, maybe like bathroom brush teeth, those kind of things, I will Duolingo just in case something in the day <clears throat> doesn't let me do this. I am so addicted that I also wrote some little note app with Twilio to text me multiple times during the day in case I forget. And I do it in the morning, so I always get this nice message, good job, instead of, why didn't you do a lingo yet? Uh, I'm also getting married in about 28 days, <coughs> so this also takes up a lot of my time. It also is in my daily reminder note app, which is on GitHub somewhere. Um, so it, it keeps me reminded of all the things I should actually be paying attention to. I, the FFCon talk was up here earlier. So my, uh, my background, so I have a, obviously American accent. Uh, I have, I'm from New York, I, but my family is Indian. <clears throat> my family is from this, so, this South Indian state over here called Kerala. Um, it is, a, it is a, actually one of the most beautiful places in India. They have a tourism campaign called God's Own Country. Uh, it is uh, seaside, fishing villages, beautiful resorts, these kinds of things. It also has um, about 38 million speakers of my family's language, which is, it's a language called Malayalam. It is the only language that is a palindrome, because it actually works both ways. Uh, it is also, it is a language with uh, some in interesting features of its script. It is not actually an alphabet. There are a few languages that, that are pretty common that we say the word alphabet for, but they're not. Malayalam is something called an abugida. Uh, which I'll, I might go into a little later if we have a little time. Their uh, Arabic is abjad. Only basically the European, the Latin alphabet is an actual alphabet. <coughs> but I am in this sort of disappointing category of first generation Indians in the United States, which are, I cannot speak that language. I can understand that language, oddly enough. My family speaks to me in Malayalam, but I can't recall fast enough to be at all effective to speak back to them, which is now, I mean, I've been disappointed about this for many years, but now that I sort of know Spanish and all these other languages, it's, it's very frustrating to me. So I, for a while, have been looking for a way to learn this language. And I, I live in a big city, a big city with lots of language education centers and classes and other things like that. And I've often been frustrated by the fact that, so Malayalam has 38 million speakers, native speakers, Swedish has about nine million native speakers. I can walk down the street from my apartment in two minutes and get $20 an hour a class to learn Swedish. There is absolutely no classes for Malayalam in the entirety of New York City. I have searched many times. <clears throat> so the way that I tried to figure out how to do this <clears throat> was to contact someone named Professor Rodney Moog. Following down my interests in, in learning languages, he is, who was a professor, of linguistics and Asian, and the, from the Department of Asian Language Studies in the University of Texas, Austin. 
he is now a country singer because he retired before I was really even old enough to try to learn this language. Um, but back in the 60s, <coughs> he was in the Peace Corps after he got his PhD, before he became a professor, and he wrote the only Malayalam to English uh, educational material in existence. This, it, it, the problem is, it was in the Peace Corps, it was in the 60s, it was not actually published at that time, um, and that because of all of these things, this is a very difficult book for me to get my hands on. Uh, so I eventually I called him and he was basically like, I'm retired, man, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> he was he's very old. This is, he's much older than this even now. Um, and eventually got through the library at the University of Texas in Austin, where I found that if I pay a, a surprisingly not that amount of, not that large amount of money, they will go into their old like record archives, they will take their old linguistic slash Malayalam learning English book, <clears throat> they will photocopy it for me, and they will mail me a photocopy. I was really excited about this. I thought, wow, this is great. I can finally actually start to learn this, this language that I've been waiting many years to try to learn. And I, I eventually, I got the book. <clears throat> they are very, very poorly photocopied because I think it's been copied many times before that. But I did get the book. <clears throat> and what I, so I started reading the book. Reading the book like, you know, you read a, start reading a programming book or something. You, you open the first page, there's some introduction and you, you see some code examples, and you're like, okay, this is, this is a little, little too much for me, but I'm gonna power through, read every line, I'll, I'll get it eventually, and then you, read, you go to the next page and the next page, and they give you some definitions, but not, not quite enough. About 10 pages in, I realize I don't know IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. I cannot read this book. I can't even really get close. The thing that I enjoyed about the book, <coughs> and that I found very uh, interesting early on, was that it gives some great diagrams for how your mouth should be positioned for different things. Because Malayalam, the language of my family, has many different letters that I can actually tell the difference with, uh, but the no normal English accent, the normal English uh, language learner cannot. Like we actually have, so English has one n, the n sound. Malayalam has n, 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 and n. There's four different sounds, and, and I, so I, me and my fiance, we, she's also into languages, and we've tried to talk about this, and, and the hardest one for her was nga, and I can actually say it, it's, it's really fine, and, and it seems so foreign as a letter that, that sort of looks like an N, but it's actually the last two letters in the word thing, so English speakers get this, it just, it's, so, it's hard to think about, because you don't think about it as, as a separate letter, na, 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 and nga are all described in excruciating detail, including tongue position in words, not just in pictures in this book. So <coughs> this set me down a path to get as amateurly interested as a programmer can get in linguistics. And what I found to take away from a lot of that was that linguistics and programming are really brothers from another mother. <clears throat> they are so excruciatingly similar. I mean, understandably, from a more academic perspective, this is actually true. Many computer scientists come from a linguistics background. Many, much of what we know in computer science comes from the study of linguistics, especially in terms of programming languages and things like that, which I'm, which I'm <clears throat> also recreationally interested in. Um, so I wanna talk to you a little bit now about some particular pieces of programming that we think about that have very interesting parallels in, in linguistics, somewhat obviously, at least at the beginning. So I wanna talk about syntax and semantics. So we use these words probably fairly frequently in, in JavaScript world or otherwise. Uh, syntax for a programmer means something fairly straightforward. Uh, it means something like if I look at a piece of code like this, and in that piece of code, I have some tokens. Breaking up those tokens, here's an if, here's a paren, here's some really long variable name, just making sure that I remember not to be using something from the Webster's Dictionary. I guess Oxford English, is that the appropriate one here? I shouldn't say Webster's, it's too American. Um, but if you, if you are an interpreter or a compiler or otherwise, there is actually a missing parentheses here. <coughs> and if you were fortunate enough to be working in Internet Explorer, you have seen something like this beautiful error message that says on line 86, well, right there, there is an expected parenthesis. Now, this is what syntax is like for, for a programmer. We are thinking about tokens, a parser looking at a piece of code, breaking up 
from, from those tokens saying, does this actually make sense? Is this, is this correct syntax? Does this match all of the rules of JavaScript? <coughs> now, syntax for a linguist is a little different. Say, very, very similar idea. Syntax for a linguist is breaking down a sentence, just like we're breaking down tokens of a piece of code, parentheses, if keyword, uh, expression, semicolons, a, a sentence, in this example, English, into different pieces, a sentence's noun phrase, verb phrase, uh, and then breaking down parts of speech such that every single word has an individual part of speech, and they come together all correctly because of that. Um, this, so what syntax, so different languages actually have different ways of expressing, for example, subject verb order. Uh, English is subject verb object. You say like, I am John, I eat fish or something. Whereas other languages, you actually say the object before the, the verb. So I fish eat or I John am. Malayalam is actually one of those languages, which is one of those really trippy things when you start to actually do the translations, because I understand it. Realizing that the language that my parents are speaking to me in does not match at all how things work in English, and, and things like that were really weird. <coughs> so now, what are semantics? Semantics in programming languages are what this, this is I, I fixed with my beautiful right parenthesis here, what programming languages allow you to do is express what something actually means. That is the semantics of a piece of code. What this means is, if some variable that I define somewhere else is actually true, to the standard out or console, wherever platform you're in, the word awesome will be printed if that all works. The semantics of a piece of code is what it actually means. Now, for a, ling for a linguist, similarly, what a sentence can actually mean is the semantics. So here we have a situation where it's, it's, it's ambiguous in this particular case, but these are two different semantics for the same sentence. Sherlock saw the man using binoculars. The semantics is the actual meaning of that sentence. Here, the meaning is Sherlock holding a pair of binoculars looking at a man. Similarly, this is an equivalently um, valid interpretation of this. Sherlock is seeing a man using binoculars. Now, semantics as a linguist is the meaning. So sometimes this, get a little, this gets a little bit more complicated in natural languages because we have the ability to put together words in ways that don't necessarily always fit with either syntax or semantics. So Noam Chomsky, he's a famous linguist, you can Wikipedia him, um, books and otherwise, uh, came up with this example. Here I have a sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This is a sentence that is complete nonsense. It does not actually make any sense. It does not convey to you any information. But I can read it like a sentence. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. It seems like it should make sense. It sounds like it should make sense. It intrinsically feels like a sentence that's, that's legit. Whereas <clears throat> if I look at this other example, furiously sleep ideas green colorless. That just, that not only does that sound wrong, that's difficult for me to say out loud. This is a big distinction between the correct syntax with absolutely no semantics. This top sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously, it is the correct syntax for, for modern American English, or uh, modern English, I guess. Uh, colorless green ideas has all the nouns and the verbs and the, um, ad, uh, the adverbs all in the right places. Whereas this second sentence <coughs> makes absolutely no sense either way. It is not only syntactically confusing, it also is nonsense and has no information in it. So in addition to syntax and semantics, so, so JavaScript, programming in general, we hear about these two all the time. But there's one other additional piece in the world of linguistics that it's actually typically talked about in threes. Not just syntax and semantics, but syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. So pragmatics is a completely different and interesting way to think about what it is we are doing when we are saying sentences, when we are writing sentences, expecting them to be read, or communicating just in general. Pragmatics as the third leg of this tripod and how to think about language from a linguistics perspective is completely about um, Language is about, pragmatics is about impact. Pragmatics is about not just what you are saying is syntactically valid, 
not just about the meaning of what that sentence is, but also what are you actually trying to get across to the other person? So let's say I invited you over to my house, we have, a, you know, have dinner, and I'm, I'm an old man and sleep at you know, 10.30 or something like that. So it comes up on 10.45, and I, I, I look at my watch, and I say, it's getting late. What is my syntax? It's, it is getting late. It is uh, four words. It, is, it has subject, verb, object, however, that, and the correct adjective. My semantics is, it is late. It means the time has gone further than some particular time. But what is my actual pragmatic intention here? It's to say, go home. <laughs> Just go home. It's late. I got to go to sleep. So this is the part that is it's, it's magical to me to think about my, most of my pre this sort of interest life was syntax and semantics. That's how programming languages work. I was a Java person and JavaScript person, and I've never thought about how human languages, natural languages, have this completely new and different concept called pragmatics. What are you actually intending to happen? What do you want the other person to take away? Now, pragmatics for a linguist additionally there are a few maxims that are typically, it's, it's, it's odd because we actually follow every single one of these rules that I'm about to tell you. And this is true not only for English speakers, this is true no matter what language you have grown up with, no matter what area of the world you come from, no matter what culture, we all obey these rules intrinsically. And this is, so this is something came up by a linguist named Paul Grice, came up with something called the cooperative principle, which is roughly, we are all in, very, in most situations trying to convey meaning in good faith to other people by the way we communicate. This is in contrast to like legalese, where you have to define, uh, I will not X, and then you have to define X, and then use every single word of X's definition, you then have to subsequently define. That's not what we are like in human languages. That's not how we're like when, we're, when we communicate to each other. So, what this, what this means is, well, underneath this sort of cooperative principle are a few what he calls maxims, which are oddly ways we always behave, typically behave, and, and we never need to think about it. The first one is the maxim of quality. The maxim of quality is roughly, we tell the truth most of the time. Like right now, I mean, I could be completely lying to you about everything I'm talking about here, and there is no such thing as the cooperative principle, Paul Grice or pragmatics, but typically you trust me. We trust each other. That's just sort of, we would be very, conversations and society would break down very quickly if this was not an expected part of natural conversation. Now the next one is something called the maxim of quantity, <coughs> which is we roughly talk to people in giving them as much information as they need, but not necessarily more than that. So this is in contrast to an extremely logical person or an extremely logical robot. That if I say, um, you know, I really like some cookies, um, and, and a robot might think, oh, that means there are some cookies that he, maybe he likes all the cookies. But realistically, in, in human conversation, if I say I like some cookies, I'm implying to you, there are some cookies I don't like. Like, don't get me those Oreos, get me the Chips Ahoy, they're so much better. Whereas a, a logical machine would, not need, would consider, oh, maybe he likes all of them. That's, that's not the way human beings interact in any culture, in any language. It, it, this is also the maxim that, that makes you really frustrated if, if, uh, if you come home and you bought a you know, cake yesterday or something, and your partner says something like, oh, I, I ate half the cake. And then you open the fridge and you see that there's no cake there. But no, you, I, I ate half the cake. I ate two halves of the cake, but I ate the cake. So that is, again, parts of conversation that we all follow this. This is just the way that the world works for us. Um, so then it's the, the, there's another one called the maxim of relevance. So relevance is around having, uh, making sure that there, there are no non sequiturs in conversation even if it really sounds like it should be a non sequitur. So if I, um, for example, if I said, well, where are, where are all of my Cheetos? And someone else says to me, oh, well, um, Alice has, has red, Remy has red fingers, orange fingers over there. Naturally, that completely makes no sense. Why are you telling me about the color of someone's fingers over there? 
But because of the maxim of relevance, I take it to mean Remy stole my Cheetos because his fingers are orange. So this is, these are things that, again, we just take for granted. We just take for granted in how we communicate with people. So and then there's the maxim of manner. So this is, we talk to kindergartners differently than we talk to adults. We typically use the right jargon and the right level of detail for our audience, both in terms of you know, speaking at conferences as well as just individual communication. We don't try to speak in less, more, we don't purposefully try to bring down our vocabulary when speaking to a first grader. This is all just what happens. When, you, when, when I talk to my family about what I do in a daily, on a, a daily job, I don't talk about syntax, semantics, or otherwise. I talk about making websites. Um, so what, the, what all of these maxima allows us to do are do something called creating implicatures. And implicatures for human language, for, for natural languages, allow us to create new knowledge when things weren't there weren't actually explicitly stated. Just in the case when I knew that Remy stole my Cheetos, no one told that to me. It's just something that I now know. If I say, um, oh, why is, uh, is Bob late today? And someone says, oh, Bob's not feeling well, Bob is sick. They didn't tell me Bob's staying at home because he's sick. It's, a, it's something that I get to understand and I make the assumption and it all works out. I take the implication. This is something that is very, I would love if programming languages could do this. If programming languages had that extra level. I think that we get close to something like this in the prologue worlds and other things like that, which I have not explored significantly. But there are immensely interesting and potential applications here for how ideally computers would be able to do all of these things for us. If anyone knows more about AI than I do, which is absolutely nothing, I'd love to talk to you about this afterwards. Um, <coughs> so. I have kept you all waiting for quite a while around my jaunt through linguistics. I could have continued to the whirlwind for at least another, you know, 45 minutes. The, the writing system stuff is really, really interesting because how alphabets work is not at all what I thought they worked like. Um, but I will, I will end the suspense a little bit and, and switch gears to be talking to you about, in particular, how I would like all of you to stare at my face for a little. So, um, so this is, I want you to watch this. It, it might be, I might be asking you, I might be asking you to stare at my face for a little bit longer than might be comfortable. But I want you to watch this with your eyes looking at the video. Don't look at your phones. I mean, I don't mind if you look at your phones, but don't do it. Just look at the video. It's like a few seconds long to play this. Face, 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 face. This, this. Okay, so looking at that video, um, there is a particular word I was saying, and I want you to trust that I have not changed the video in what I'm about to do. Okay, I want you to think about the word I was just saying as you watch that video, and now I want you all to close your eyes. Do not look at the screen. Now you can look at your phone. Trust that I am playing the exact same video. I just told you all I could be lying, though. Damn. Um, so now I'm going to play the same video again. Face, 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 face. So did anyone hear something different the second time? OK, hands are, hands are going up, roughly. So I think that the gigantic screen with the low res might have done a little bit to this. So this is uh, um, a psychological effect. The first, the entire video, I was actually saying the word vase, V-A-S-E. If you look at the video, especially if you are in the range with viewing my mouth, you, most people, I think it's like 90% or something of the population, hear the word base, B-A-S-E. This is the weirdest thing, because for me, this works every single time regardless. I, I get really freaked out by the fact that when I close my eyes, I'm hearing something completely different. I've had to prove it to myself that this actually works many times. This is what I call, this is the McGurk phenomenon. If you actually want to Google this, this is the McGurk effect. So the, the McGurk effect is this, this uh, weird psycholinguistic uh, phenomenon where our brains interpret more 
what our eyes are seeing than necessarily what our ears are hearing. So I'll have another demo in a little bit. We'll see if see if that works a little bit better. The McGurk effect. So the guy who made this, it's it's uh, his name is Harry McGurk. According to Google, it's one of these people. I I I, I, I don't know which one. I'm going with high probability this one because it's got the name in the image, but it is definitely a white guy, roughly, roughly. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so the McGurk effect, it's, it's, it's very Googleable. It is not just base and base. You can do this with a lot of different uh, consonant vowel pairings. So fa, ga, ba, ma, there are, I think, six or seven different groupings. The easiest ones with respect to English words are base and base. Um, this is something that, that there, you, there can actually be a slight delay between when the mouth is moving and when, your, uh, when the sound is playing, approximately 200 milliseconds. This has actually been studied by both Harry McGurk and subsequent, I think, contemporaries of his, uh, of him. He's actually British, by the way. He's a British psychologist from London. All these interesting things I'm learning about English. Um, so also, that the, the focus, something that, as you um, watch more of these, you don't actually need to be looking directly at the mouth, which I find really interesting. It needs to be close enough in your field of view to be able to trick your brain into being able to see this correctly, but it does not actually need to be staring at, at, at the lips. So this completely, like, this, this whole idea broke my brain. I have seen lots of like optical illusion videos. I really, I have, on my coffee table, I have this little book of, of optical illusions that I flip through every once in a while. I find them very interesting. But, I've ne but all of them, I sort of know that if I close my eyes in this way or do something else, I know how they work a little bit. Whereas this is completely screwing with my head as to how, how all of this will work. If you Google for if you Google for this, you'll get lots of videos. Uh, the BBC did some special on this a couple of years ago, and you, you, there are lots of uh, there are lots of studies and/or TV shows that show this off every once in a while. But what I wanted to do is build something that did not require me going into Premiere, changing videos, making um, cutting out the audio of one thing in Premiere, moving it to another one, or iMovie or something like that. I wanted to make something really easy such that the people that could be in these videos are not these random people, but that they could be you. Each and every one of you. Uh, and me, because it's a lot easier that way. So what I did is I made this, <coughs> this tool that I'm, I'm kind of glad that there's no internet here so this does not go down. I made this tool called makemagurk.com. Uh, and you are probably like if the first thing you're looking at this and the first thing you're thinking is is wow uh, This is really ugly and and I I know and I agree uh, But it the, the nice part that I'm very happy about is that it, it actually works <laughs> That it works pretty well and and eventually I'll work on the copy and things like that so the I'll, I'll show you I'll show you a video roughly about how this thing works and, and it, it does have it has sound and it'll keep It'll make it easy to show how we can actually make one of these if you use this site. Here's a demo of makemagurk.com. You say it a lot. Vase. 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 My beautiful red stop, don't you like it? It's, it's a set timeout, Base. background Base. color, red. Base. It's beautiful. Base. 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 So, and then this thing processes for a while, uh, and then it eventually uh, spits back out your encoded WebM that you can actually download, send to your, your friends or otherwise. Um, and so I, there's, I, th I thought the loading was be a little, my, my machine's a little slow. That's okay. So how I wanted to make this thing, I, I had a few different attempts. Uh, you can go back through my GitHub. I have, I have had a few different failed attempts and some just really bad quality ones. How I, how I wanted to do this, and I thought this would be so straightforward. The web browsers have get user media now. They have web audio. They have this new, this relatively new thing called um, the, Media Recorder API, 
And then there's this thing that is a it's actually a hackathon project from uh, Node KO 2012, I think, that they still maintain and it roughly works, called videoconverter.js. Now, videoconverter.js is FFmpeg, the, the Linux, uh, the, the C library and the command line utility to encode videos, put through mscripten, which is, I don't know if you don't know, it is this tool that takes C and C++ or in many languages and converts them into JavaScript and spits out basically FFmpeg as a JavaScript file that turns out to be roughly 50 megabytes of JavaScript. <laughs> and it takes roughly, um, let's say, it takes roughly 10, 15 seconds on my you know, relatively modern machine to even load the JavaScript, just to, to get, minified or not, it doesn't matter. And then to actually convert a 10 second video, to encode a 10 second video, it takes about two minutes. And, and the example I just showed you, if I did let it finish, it would take about 20 seconds or so. Two minutes is, 20 seconds is already pretty slow, and that's because I, this whole thing is on a shared VPS somewhere. But, so how I wanted to do this was all web, all web, uh, all web APIs completely in the browser, don't need anything else. And I tried this, and I was fairly successful. And then it totally did not work, and, and, and it was too slow, and, and I did not use it that way. So eventually, what I ended up doing <coughs> was using um, a little bit more convoluted Rube Goldberg-like Goldberg -like style. I thought this was really simple. Uh, I had to then use other libraries, and then I decided to just use Node. And what did I do with Node? I shelled out to FFmpeg. And I got it done really quickly. So now we're down to, so sometimes this goes, if there's no one else using the machine, this can get as quick as like four or five seconds in order to convert, convert one of these videos. Um, and so how I needed to do this is, the, the way that the application works is it takes, it takes your video, let me go back to there. <coughs> so it takes one video of you saying the word vase, one video of you saying the word vase, it then in the browser, it takes the, so there, there is a metronome going that says the timing, uh, it says the words at the right time. It cuts off in audio from the audio buffer. It cuts off in the right places to try to align them as closely as possible because in the beginning it's sort of hard to, it, it, you mess up very easily because you don't, you have to catch up to when the first metronome tick happens. Um, <clears throat> then I, uh, so in web audio, I actually do all the audio editing, cut off the ends, splice everything together and switch the audio tracks from one video to another, uh, which, actually does, which actually does work pretty well. So web audio, is, uh, I skipped that. web audio is awesome because it allowed me to do all those things that I just said and it actually works. But web audio is also really frustrating. And, and the reason it's frustrating is because, so first of all, the, there, are, there are lots of libraries for all of this. And the libraries, in web audio make me sort of feel like 2007 web dev, where it is jQuery, Prototype, MooTools, Dojo, and something else. And you know that if you try really hard, you might be able to do this on your own without any library, but it just feels like there are lots of competitors and we don't quite know who's going to win out there with respect to even cr the simplest thing in web audio, which is creating a metronome. The, only, the, the biggest thing here that I did in web audio or the most complicated part was not the splicing of audio in, together in with video or cutting off trimming at the right times. It was getting, getting multiple timers to sync. And the reason for that is the second thing that's really horrible about web, web audio is that the way web audio works with clocks is really complicated and confusing because Web Audio's timer is actually immensely accurate. It is 14 significant digits on the millisecond or something. It is, it is really, really good. But set timeout, which is the typical way in JavaScript to do anything, is not nearly as good. So making those work together was very, very difficult. There is a great blog post that I linked to um, from Chris Wilson on HTML5 Rocks that addresses this problem a little bit. I thought, I, I went through the whole, let me, let me just go through some blog posts, copy and paste what I need to copy and paste. I should be able to get a metronome going in, in 20 minutes. This is, there's tons of demos out there. And then realizing the moment I needed to sync that with anything else in JavaScript, I needed to go and research a lot about how to do this. He does have a great technique that is extremely hacky but sort of works that, that is implemented here, so, so I figured it out. 
but web audio in clocks and setting timeouts and even animations for request animation frame are, is right now extremely complicated. So this is a project that is continuing to uh, grow and build for me. Ideally, there are lot, lot of, there are, you know videos up there already that you can see demos and things like that. Uh, my infinite to-do list right now is first make it not Chrome only. It started off actually not Chrome only, but then I think that both I think that both Firefox and Chrome changed the or updated whatever Media Recorder API pieces they were using or implemented, and now it is Chrome only because I haven't gone back through and checked. Uh, the second one is make sure that if you all had the internet, which I'm so grateful you don't, that this whole thing would not go down um, because it probably would. Uh, the next one is better user experience, better uh, instructions and copy. Like I, right now, it's just sort of at the stage where it works, and I'm really, really excited that it works because you can make these videos yourself. But if you don't see a demo and reading those instructions, it's really, I, it's like I don't know English or how to write. I don't know. Um, fine tuning synchronization. I want to get this timer thing even better because right now it's roughly at maybe a little less than 50, about 75% of the time it'll work on the first try. Uh, or it'll work such that the times are exactly in, syncing enough so that you create the correct video. Um, and then I have so many more things, so many more things. And in this, in this process, I figured a lot of things out that I am very proud of and excited to be um, you know, talking about. There are, it, took, it took a hell of a lot of moving around what I expected to do, but eventually I actually did do, did, did, was able to do this. I was able to create my own Custom, no library, did not use audio lib or, or any, of, any of the other things. Metronome with MP3s to play the word bass and the word bass. Um, someone from some dictionary somewhere said that extremely correctly for me to take. Um, compiled FFmpeg successfully on OSX and Ubuntu, which is actually surprisingly complicated. Um, but if I had something great like Puppet or Chef, maybe that would be more straightforward for me. Um, then got SSL working. Which is actually not that, it's not that crazy. I'm very excited for letsencrypt.org because eventually I will not need to pay for, hopefully it will pay, pay much less, for SSL certificates. And the, and the reason for that is because get user media, if you don't want to keep having the annoying pop-ups, like, yes, please allow this, please allow this, please allow this, you have to be over HTTPS. Uh, similarly for service worker and some other things. Uh, and then the, the other nice like little perk here is that it's actually a React app which is hard to believe because it's so ugly and React is so new and fancy and shiny, but it does allow me to like play around with these, these sort of new, new technologies. So what I want to tell you here is that, I, so I have, there are a lot of both programming and non-programming interests here that sort of coalesced into this project that I'm very interested in and excited about. And this is something that you can do too. Like I am not, it took me a while to get into side project mode because for many years, I was so not at all inside project mode. But now that it's here and it's something that very much overlaps with my non-programming interests, because I have many of those, uh, it was really exciting to be able to, to build this project. And I encourage all of you to explore the things that you are actually interested outside of programming as a programmer. You might find that the overlap is, is fruitful. Um, and also because I didn't want to, I mentioned earlier, I didn't want to talk about the uh, Webster's or Oxford English Dictionary. I also just wanted to show you Urban, Urban Dictionary, which does have a dictionary for, uh, entry for success, which is actually really good, the product of constantly striving for self-improvement. I was hoping for something a little bit more, I don't know, raunchy or something, but apparently, apparently Urban Dictionary gets it right and good too. Um, so I made this thing. I would love for all of you to use this, play around with it. If you want to open a PR for design, I would love that, but do not uh, concern yourself with such things. I think so. you are able to, as soon as you do get internet, actually go and make videos and download them. There's a download link below this after you make one. Um, I want to, so my, uh, so over the past, let's say two months, my, um, my fiance has had to deal with me randomly saying, vase, vase, <laughs> vase. <laughs> because there's no, I mean, I, I've tried to make it a little bit more interesting to make the video and I can smile, but it's still, it's repetitive and annoying. Um, so I wanted to thank her for putting up with me. And she actually made one of the best uh, videos of this um, earlier, on, earlier on before I got all of the metronome stuff working. 
Um, so I'll show you this one too. Vase, 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 vase. Close your eyes. Vase, vase, vase. So again, I wanted to thank her. She's done a lot of listening to this, and I'll be marrying her in 28 days, so I'm really excited. Um, so I am, so I'm John Paul. If you want to find me online, you're free to NPM install me. It will give you all the contact information, um, contact information and otherwise. Um, so I am the CTO of a company called In Rhythm in New York. Uh, if you were there, I would love for you to work with me if you wanted to go there. Similarly, uh, I want to thank them for, I'm really excited to be here representing them, do amazing JavaScript things and otherwise. Uh, if you are in New York, please reach out to me. Uh, similarly in New York, so I run the NYC HTML5 meetup, which if any of you are there, I will probably make you speak at the meetup, so be careful if you tell me that one. Uh, but I wanted to mention that this logo is actually already SVG, which is great. I did that like a while ago. Um, <clears throat> so, so thank you so much. Thank you, Remy, Julie, otherwise sponsors. Thank you for listening to me. I hope you all have a great lunch and love my beautiful drawing. This is as close as I can get.